Yeah, thank you very much, Natasha and, and Hakan. And thank you to our guest speakers, Jackie Fernandez, Freddie McConnell, Richard Scarlett, Erica Tranfield, and Alan White. And uh, I will introduce each one of you uh, in a moment um, uh, when, when we'll invite you to say a few words. Uh, and thank you everyone for, for joining. Uh, my name is Martin. I'm a co-convener of, of this research network and, and meeting with Natasha and Hakan. And before I hand over to our guests, let me just briefly say that the idea for this round table emerged from our discussions on reproductive rights and social justice, because we first observed that the families that LGBTQ people create get organized in order to fight for reproductive rights, for full recognition, and against some forms of stigmatization. And we have seen that many of those rights have been gradually recognized in the UK since adoption rights in 2005, through surrogacy in 2010, for example, gay marriage in 2014 in England, England Wales, and Scotland, and then 2020 in Northern Ireland. But at the same time, this is all still relatively new. And we do remember that only just over three decades ago, in 1988, Margaret Thatcher's government introduced Section 28, that it was in place until the early 2000s, and that banned teaching of homosexuality at school, and it banned describing gay and lesbian relationships as pretended family relationships, as it called it. And we can also see that not everything is easy today. And for this reason, LGBTQ people's families get organized for social justice and reproductive justice as well today. For example, when it comes to discussions about social class and equal access to reproductive options. Recently, we've also had um, uh, it uh, in the news uh, in, uh, in case of um, lesbian couples and uh, transparent families. And I hope we, we can speak about it today. So when it comes to discussions about solidarities between LGBTQ families and migrants uh, or other vulnerable groups uh, is also another uh, topic of importance. So at this round table, first of all, we would like to meet you, activists, parents, intended parents who identify as LGBTQ, and we'd love to hear your family stories to the extent that you can share them. How did you get to have a family, right? So that's the first thing that we would like to ask you. And secondly, we would also like to ask you, what do you think the current issues are uh, for LGBTQ people's families? Or on a more personal level, why and how you got involved in different forms of activism or public activity for the, for the community? So um, in the first hour of our meeting, we'll invite everyone to say a few words uh, and then, um, in the second part, we'll invite everyone to have a discussion, pose questions to our speakers. And uh, without uh, further ado, we'll follow the alphabetical order that you can see on the event website. Uh, so let me first invite uh, Jackie Fernandez, uh, who is a parent to three children and independent member, vice chair and chair of several adoption and fostering panels and the volunteer for New Family Social. So thank you very much, Jackie. Hello there. I'm not usually used to going first so fast. I'm usually a bit lower down in the, the alphabetical order. Hello, everyone. I'm Jackie. Um, as Martin said, um, I sit on a number of panels as an independent panel member, so uh, on adoption and fostering panels, and also I chair some panels. Basically, those panels make a recommendation about whether uh, people are suitable to adopt, um, and also whether a match with a child is the right match for the child. So that's the, the adoption panels. Um, but I'm here today really on behalf of New Family Social. I've been a volunteer for them for about 10 years now. Um, I've recently just been voted on as a trustee as well. Um, New Family Social, for those who don't know much about them, is a national organisation that started in 2007. Um, and it's, it's there to support um, LGBT plus adopters uh, and foster carers. Um, we have more than five and a half thousand members at the moment and um, also um, the training that is delivered to social workers in terms of um, LGBT awareness and um, also trans awareness and gender diversity is also something that's picking up as well. Um, but I want to start with the fact um, in England the, the latest statistics say that one in six adoptions are by same-sex couples which is a huge amount of the population when you think about it. But that doesn't include LGBT single adopters and foster carers, of which there are many. So there is so much work to be done in terms of monitoring. 
I'm one of the same sex couples and we adopted our son um, a number of years ago. Um, so I'll give you a really quick timeline, but I won't bore you with it. Um, but um, I'll share a quick uh, thing if I can actually see what I'm doing. Give me one second. Um, so basically in 1999, I got together with my partner um let's have a look if i see if i could actually find her at all um where is she uh there she is let's get big uh let me share my screen uh share screen uh, there it is um and then i need to pull it over sorry um yes that's my partner that is my partner was um that's tall doherty she's also the chief executive of new family social i got together with her way before she got together with new family social and um we looked together in 1999 and by 2004 we started talking about having children so back then it was very difficult to have children um we basically looked around to see what clinics would accept same sex couples and out of all of the clinics in england there are only two that would accept same-sex couples back in 2004, fertility clinics we're talking about. Um, so it was very interesting when we went there. Um, basically, there were two prices for heterosexual couples because they could get a free IVF treatment on for free. Um, but for same-sex couples, we had to pay the full whack. And that was a lot of money each month if you wanted to have a child. Um, so I started first and that was quite a long, long, arduous task. And then um, I had to a miscarriage and then um, we swapped luckily um, and my partner Tor became pregnant with our eldest son who was born in 2006 and then shortly after that our daughter was born um, in 2009 but then there was no legal relationship um, in terms of recognizing me as their other parent so I had to go through and apply to adopt them so my children who were um, uh, conceived by Victoria um, have now got adoption um, certificates rather than their own birth certificates but I had to go through that process because there was no recognition until recently that um, partners of same-sex couples could be on birth certificates. So in 2011 stupidly we decided there was more space in our family even though I was very tired uh, and hadn't ever had a decent night's sleep. So we always had adoption in mind um, and um, once again we struggled to find an agency because as you can see we're a mixed race couple and our children are mixed race and um, where I live in Cambridgeshire, the social worker was really honest. She said, look, we haven't got any mixed race children in Cambridge at the time in 2011. So we went on what is called a national register. And we went on an exchange day looking for um, our, our youngest. Um, and we had to go through an agency, um, an adoption agency. But even then, that was really, really hard to find an agency that would accept same sex couples. But we did find one and eventually we were very proactive about looking for children. We went um, on a really, really cold, cold um, January um, one year. It was snowing. We went to Walsall Football Stadium, which I didn't know they had. And it was just snowing. It was cold. And um, we went there and we just picked up loads and loads of flyers, these one page like adverts of these children. And we were looking for a boy um, and we picked up loads of, of um, uh, uh, pa paperwork about these children that we would look at. We sat down and we um, had a coffee and went through them. And amongst them, we found our son. Um, we went to the social worker who was um, looking after, the authority that was looking after him. And she gave me some chewy sweets, which always, always is a plus with me. And she won me over already. And she gave us a report about him and we read it. And by then our hearts were melted um, and we went through the adoption process with him. Um, he was 30 months old when he was adopted with us. Um, he's now nine and a half um, and he's just the light of our life and he fits in just beautifully into our family. Um, so that's a really quick gallop through what I did, but there's some really interesting facts that you should remember that a lot of the children, no matter what kind of trauma they've had, they've had trauma, they've had losses. Um, they've had losses in their first year of being born um, in this planet. They've lost their birth parents. They could have lost their foster carers. Certainly our son did. Um, so that will stay with them for the rest of their lives and you'll have to support them with, with that for the rest of their lives. Um, and also there's a wide range of people who can adopt and foster as well. So it's, you shouldn't write yourself off because you shouldn't write yourself off if you think you've had a mental health problem. That's actually a really good thing if you've shown that you've actually sought support and you actually learned from it and you, you're better for it. Um, it's, a, it's a positive thing because a lot of people get really scared about mental health issues. So there's a lot of facts that can be demystified there. 
But um, in, uh, life now with my children, like my eldest is 15, my, mid, my daughter's 12, and my youngest who we adopted is nine. Um, and they're just thriving on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's just brilliant. And, um, you know, um, it's just a lovely, lovely family to have, even though I get tired um, and like, I, I can't believe the kind of fussy food they eat, but, um, but you know, it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Jackie. And, I, and I'm sure that, that what you've just said also um, um, already encourages us to think about quite a few questions for later. Um, and uh, meanwhile, for now, we would invite our second speaker to say a few words and, and we'll move on to discussion later on. Our second speaker would be uh, Freddie uh, McConnell, uh, who's a writer, journalist and trans solo dad by choice protagonist of the film Seahorse that many of, of us, many of you may have seen. Uh, so, um, Freddy, um, could you please join us in saying a few words? Yeah, thank you. Um, also, just to say, if, if I get interrupted, my little one is uh, here in the same room as me. So um, don't be alarmed. Um, so, yeah, I, it's interesting listening to your introduction, Martin, about and the sort of three questions you posed about how we became family, uh, what are the issues currently facing parents like us, and then sort of what our activism looks like. I don't honestly think I could separate those three things in my own personal situation. They are kind of the same question, I feel like. Um, and I'm going to try and, I mean, there's, there's a lot of detail and a lot of complexity when it comes to the issues facing trans parents in particular in the UK. I'll try and keep it relatively simple by just sort of talking about my own experience. Um, and I would say also that the issues that we face can sort of be broadly divided into two categories. Um, the first one being medical uh, and sort of uh, accessing the NHS and then what happens when you do access the NHS and that kind of thing. And the other um, half is legal. Um, yeah, legal issues. And, and I think, I suppose probably every parent and how they become a parent will we be differently affected by by the, those two sides um but i don't think there could be a trans parent in the uk who wasn't at least a bit affected probably a lot affected by all of it to be honest because <laughs> we're still sort of in the dark ages when it comes to recognizing trans parents in all sorts of ways so i'll start um by talking i mean the best way for me to talk about the medical side of things is just to describe my own experience because i think i kind of went through the process of uh, not understanding or being misinformed and then understanding and being able to become a dad in the way that I chose to, which was through conception with, with donor sperm and pregnancy and birth. So I came out as trans, as a transgender man when I was at university, I was just finishing up university. So I was uh, in my mid twenties, I took a while to graduate and part of the process of getting to the gender clinic in London was being referred sorry um and part of the conversation that we started having very early on was around you know testosterone and transition medical transition that was the assumption it was also what I wanted but like even back in well, this would have been 2011 2012 Things were much more rigid then than I understand they are today. So you're sort of, you go to the gender clinic and you enter this one medical pathway of, you know, and they, they use language like becoming a man or becoming a woman. And even though that's not how most trans people actually understand our experiences. Um, and with that came a discussion of infertility or, or sort of a brief mention of it. And I just already knew that that was a thing that I would be facing because that was what the people, people in the trans community believed as well. And I thought that testosterone would make me sterile. And I was told that. And then obviously, if you go on to have the expected surgeries like hysterectomy and lower surgery, um, then then that's sort of, uh, you know, that's infertility sort of uh, tied into that. And I'd always wanted kids and I'd always wanted to be a parent and I never really imagined how it would happen. But um, I said to my mum at the time, who was very supportive and to the consultant at the gender clinic, well, I'll just adopt in a very like naive mid-20s way um which I now understand to be naive and frankly quite offensive um to adoptive families and but deep down I did have doubts and I did have worries about that 
and um but I knew that transition was something I needed and I couldn't look after any anyone else if I hadn't looked after myself first um to put it succinctly so then about two years later I happened upon a video on YouTube of a pregnant trans man and honestly if it hadn't been for that that like chance encounter with a video on YouTube I might not have become a parent I might not know that that was possible for me um and for other trans men not just some but as far as we can tell all of us so we're misinformed by our doctors on the NHS it's just standard it's it's sort of so unknown that it's still happening um and and the assumptions that are made about what testosterone does to your fertility and now also with the kind of media environment in the UK um compounding those messages and fear-mongering around trans people's fertility which wasn't really a thing when I first started transitioning in, in 2012 2013 but now that's one of the main um I feel like sort of um, quote gender critical talking points um the reality is we actually know there is emerging evidence that testosterone does not cause infertility trans men who are non-binary people can conceive um you know, in all sorts of ways, in any way they choose to, um, no matter how long they've been on T. Um, there was an absence of evidence before this. There was an absence of research, which meant that there was an assumption that testosterone would cause infertility, probably partly at least based on the fact that estrogen does cause infertility um, eventually in trans women um, and non-binary people um, who were assigned male at birth. So, yeah, you can see how easy it is to get into the weeds on this stuff. But basically, you know, I had to unlearn a lot of the stuff that I'd been taught. And then I, on top of that, I had to learn, unlearn a lot of the sort of um, fear and shame I felt around the desire to become a parent. Because another thing that happens when you go to a gender clinic is that you are told that being a man means certain things. You kind of have this understanding that you have to fulfill certain stereotypes. And even if that's not how you express your gender or feel about your gender, you end up fitting a kind of mold that that the gender clinic wants to see so the idea of sort of saying i really want to be a dad kind of might freak a consultant out which in turn might can freak you out so i had to overcome all of that and i gave birth to my son who you can probably hear uh in early 2018 and you may have seen that even happening in seahorse um as it was beautifully captured by Jeannie finley um and then that's where we get and actually you know i say medical issues Here's my son. <laughs> Here's my son. Um, the medical issues, thankfully, sort of end at the point at which you might stop testosterone and uh, and conceive, you know, because then you can have a healthy pregnancy. And I was very lucky to have the birth that I wanted. And then I restarted testosterone and sort of quite quickly got back to where I was in terms of my personal comfort and medical transition. Um, so even though there are huge barriers that we face, lots of trans men and non-binary people talk about the experience of pregnancy as being uh, in and of itself positive and manageable and you know quite private you know depending on how how people choose to talk about it or share it um so i think there's a misconception that people think trans men will find pregnancy itself very traumatizing very hard um but actually it's not it's it's the kind of structural barriers that we face that are much more of a, of a difficulty and the assumptions the assumptions that we're going to find it hard can be hard to overcome if you see what i mean but yeah as soon as then your kid is born you face this other set of challenges which are legal and um i suppose the, the easiest way to explain that is that, that there is just no legal recognition for transgender parents in the uk um i did have childcare plans but it fell through hey Right, here we go. Okay. Um, so yes, no legal recognition in the Birth Death Registration Act, in the Human Fertilization and Embryology Act, all the laws you mentioned marching at the beginning, um, even the Gender Recognition Act from 2004, because back then there was no imagining that trans people would one day become parents post transition. Even though at the time it was a very progressive piece of legislation, the GRA today sits very uncomfortably with the trans community because it really emphasizes the idea of secrecy and of blending in. So the, the whole point of getting a gender recognition certificate 
is mostly about sort of passing as cis. So there's a huge emphasis on privacy. And for instance, like your tax records go into a different system, which I've been told is the same system that people under witness relocation are in. Um, Cause like you couldn't possibly ever want anyone knowing you were trans, like that's what it's all about. Um, and you're expected to probably have to kind of abandon your family and maybe your children and start a new life and with a new name and a new birth certificate, which has its upsides, but also means you're just completely erasing your history and your transness, which nowadays, thankfully, due to more acceptance isn't necessary. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the bit in the GRA that's about parenthood, section 12, refers to people who already parents when they apply for their gender recognition certificate. When I bought my court case to try and be registered as their father or the parent on my little one's birth certificate, um, the government argued successfully, which was totally shocking um, and still is very shocking, that actually section 12 is meant to apply regardless of when a trans person becomes a parent. And the, the upshot of that, which a lot of people don't realize, um, I found myself constantly having to explain, is that it doesn't just affect someone like me who gives birth, but supposedly that means that a trans man who is married to a cis woman and the cis woman gives birth and he has a GLC and they, con and they conceived at a fertility clinic with donor sperm, he also cannot register as the father. And actually in reality, people like that do register as the father all the time in the gender, uh, sorry, the uh, general register office, GRO, registers them as father because that's how it reads the, GR, the GRA, <laughs> so many acronyms. So the government said that section 12 um, stops anyone ever from having gender recognition as a parent. But in reality, there is a double standard where actually it's only people who become pregnant who don't have their parenthood recognized um, in, their, in their legal gender. And the judge dealt with this by deciding that mother is no longer a gendered term because women and transgender men can be mother and it doesn't invalidate my gender recognition certificate doesn't make me legally not a man anymore i'm just a man for some purposes and then a woman or and a mother or not even a woman in fact but just a mother for parenthood which is exactly what the gra was designed to deal with when the european court of human rights ruled that member states had to provide a means of legal gender recognition that no longer left trans people in a limbo state that's exactly what i'm in now although my child doesn't actually have a birth certificate because the court case is ongoing um, I'm aware that I've spoken for a long time, so I'll probably leave it there. But yes, I submitted an FOI to the GRO today <laughs> to ask them about this situation um, around what happens to trans men who don't give birth and how are they registered? Is there a policy on it? Because if there is, then that directly contradicts what the government said in my case. But honestly, it's so hard to even explain to like very supportive people what the issues are, um, as I've probably conveyed just now that uh, it's just chipping away extremely slowly at a big, big old problem. <laughs> but yeah, and I'm, and I'm pregnant now and I'm having my second kid uh, and I have to go to Sweden to do that. And I haven't even been able to talk about that. But if you want to ask me about it, go for it. Thank you very much, Freddie. Can you hear me? I can see that my video got frozen, mm -hmm. but you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I hope it I hope the video returns. I don't know why this happened. Apologies. Um, thanks so much, Freddie. And I hope we can discuss a few things um, also in the discussion part about um, your uh, recent campaign and, and decisions as well, which is very relevant. So 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 thank you. And and um, we'll move on now to Erica Tranfield. Um, no, sorry, not yet. That's alphabetical. <laughs> sorry about that. I'll, I'll, I'll go alphabetically as, as we have it in the, in the, uh, on the website to Richard, Richard Scarlett first, um, who's a writer, uh, speaker, marketing professional, parent to a toddler via gestational surrogacy in the United States. Um, Richard, uh, over to you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Richard. I am... Um... I work in marketing, but I guess what brought me here today, um, as just said, is I'm a gay dad um, living here in London um, with my husband and our three-year-old son, who was born uh, in the US via surrogacy in 2018. Um, 
so just a little bit about our journey and the kind of family background um, to, to provide some context. So my husband and I have pretty much always talked about being parents. Um, and it's something that we talked about very early in our dating days, um, because I think for both of us, it was um, a bit of a deal breaker if the other person didn't feel the same. So we, we wanted to just lay that on the table, which some people may think is a bit premature, but it was that important to us that we wanted to just make sure that we were on the same page um, before progressing things. Luckily we were. Um, at the time we didn't really understand or know how it would happen um, because we, we weren't really uh, sure about the options available to us. Um, but one thing that we both agreed on that we, we didn't want our sexuality or our biology to um, prevent us from, from taking this journey and, and achieving our dream parenthood. Um, so when the time was right, we attended a lot of seminars, we did a lot of research, um, and we spoke to the very few people that we knew who'd done it before, um, just to try and understand the various routes um, to parenthood. And we opted for surrogacy um, because I think we wanted, um, at least for our first child, to have a distinct biological link to one of us. Um, so we put adoption um, on the table for maybe later um, or a sibling. Um, and then we started looking at where to do it. So, you know, the, the geographic landscape for surrogacy is changing all of the time with, with various different legal issues arising um, and subsiding. So we, long story short, we settled on the US because we felt that that was where the legal framework was best. The US was um, the more secure option for us. We wanted to move quickly um, and the US would be able to provide us with that obviously at a cost, um, but we, we kind of weighed up all the options and we went down that route. The process itself was, was quite procedural. Um, for want of a better phrase. In the US, there are no strangers to surrogacy. So once you make the connections with clinics and agencies and things like that, it's a lot of form filling at the beginning, um, a lot of paperwork once you found your match, and um, there are chemistry meetings and things like that, um, which I understand is very, very different um, to the UK process, having, having friends who've, who've been through it on this side of the pond. Um, luckily, we had a successful first transfer. Um, so our son, as I said, was born um, nine months after that in Idaho, of all places. Um, we spent six weeks in Idaho with our son, which was interesting and um, being in probably the furthest part of America that you can be in with a newborn. Um, and it was just surreal as pay people with parents can understand those first few months are quite tricky. Um, when we returned to the UK, um, we applied for a parental order um, in order to get my partner um, and I recognised in the UK as our son's parents. So that was about six months worth of paperwork that we, um, that we had to do. And that was finally granted in uh, February 2019. Um, in terms of the second part of the question, um, Someone else recently asked me how and why I became an activist. And to be absolutely honest, it's not something that I ever set out to do. Um, it's just that the more I talk about this and I do kind of talk about our journey and surrogacy issues at quite a few events and things like that. And the more I do that, the more I realize that there are some significant societal issues, I guess, that, and legal issues that can be sticking points um, for queer parents or intended parents um, pursuing an alternative route. And we've heard some of them already. Um, so I think it's important to keep having these conversations. Um, things are very much far from level, um, to put it bluntly, and it's really complicated or it can be really complicated for people um, in the position that I was in three years ago or four years ago. Um, and even beyond birth, you know, in those early years of parenthood, there are issues that that just continue through. Um, with regard to those issues and the ones that I'm passionate about, I think I can broadly categorize those into three areas based on my experience so far. Um, and the first one is in the workplace. So I, when my son was born, I took um, almost a year off to look after him. 
Um, and I was lucky enough to work for an employer that supported this. Um, but having friends um, in a similar position to me, it's very clear that not everyone does and not everyone has that type of employer. Um, the legal basis is there. So I was able to take that much time off because surrogacy um, or parents do surrogacy can leave on adoption leave, which essentially grants the same as maternity leave um, that, that mothers would get. Um, so the legal basis is there, but there are still a lot of gender stereotyping that we find and unconscious bias in many, many workplaces that needs to be addressed if we are to truly level the playing field. Um, and this normally shows when it comes to either requesting parental leave or even requesting uh, childcare um, leave or emergency visits to nursery or whatever to pick up your child. Um, I've, I've heard instances where, you know, dads, not necessarily gay dads, but have been denied that opportunity to go and pick up their child if they need to, because the assumption is that there's a mother there that would do that and that is her role to do that. Um, so as a gay dad, that made it very interesting for me. Um, and, you know, my family dynamic meant that our workplace had to do a lot of um, learning. It was a steep learning curve for them. Um, but thankfully, it wasn't too much of an issue. And I, in many ways, became kind of the poster boy for how to do it, you know, because they wanted to be this inclusive company, but they'd never had that case in point until I came along and requested all of these things, which were not, you know, unreasonable. It's just what a, a, a straight person would get or a mother would get. Um, so it was just trying to trying to balance that out. But like I said, a lot of people still have those huge barriers to break down before they can even start to have those conversations. Um, so the more that we have events like this and the more that, you know, the news cycle continues the way that it is, hopefully it will become um, more, more acceptable and easier to have those conversations in the workplace. The second is um, to do just with... Um, my life as a toddler, with a toddler, essentially, and some of the outdated um, norms that we came about and that um, particularly male primary um, caregivers can face. Um, it's something that you don't always notice until you're affected directly by it, because we didn't, for sure. Um, but when it comes to certain activities that you might do with your toddler or your baby or whatever, a lot of the advertising, um, the socializing of it and the groups that we found, they're so heavily geared to mums on maternity leave. And that was quite difficult for us or for me as the primary caregiver to find a safe space where I could assimilate into um, and make friends and have play dates and things like that. Um, because the traditional, especially where we live at the moment, the traditional family structure, is so ingrained it can make you either an outsider or a novelty um, so for example when I walk into mum and baby yoga the first you know the first question is what are you doing here or are you babysitting or is it dad's day to have the baby so there are a lot of things there that you know it's not easy to change because a lot of it is cultural but again the more that you know the more visibility that we have in terms of our alternative family structures um, the more we can hopefully see a change with that. And we're starting to, um, we're starting to see more parent and baby rather than mum and baby particularly, um, because I've spoken to a lot of the, um, you know, the, the organizers that I can, um, and just pointed out the way that that can make non-mums feel when they walk into that. But I'm also aware that it's quite an emotive and somewhat hot button topic um, because, I found that there's a lot of camaraderie around um, mothers who have given birth, for example, um, because, you know, they, they, they can share that bond with each other. Then if I walk in, um, I've had people assume that I've taken the easy route or slightly darker than that. I've gone and bought a baby. Um, so I struggle where to kind of fit into that sort of dynamic. Um, so essentially, we need to get to a place where alternative parenting journeys are normalized um, so that we're no longer different and invite questions um, at mum and baby yoga. Lastly, on the legal side, um, you know, that, that depending on where you sit on this, the UK surrogacy laws are very, very outdated and they are in need of change. Um, they were created a long time ago and have been fairly updated since then, which makes it really difficult for people like myself and um, anyone else pursuing an alternative route to, to parenthood. Um, 
like me, they often have to go abroad um, and spend quite huge sums of money. Um, and without the right guidance, um, they can go to risky markets, you know, where, where bringing their child home or even just being re recognized as parents or having that legal safety net has gone out the window because, you know, when you're on this journey, you, you tend to sometimes be quite subjective about things and run with your emotions. Um, and, you know, if you see what looks like um, a good thing in one market, sometimes you might not consider everything else. So, and then even when, when we come home, we have to, like I said, face a mountain of paperwork, even just to be named as parents, despite everything that we've gone through in the other country to, to become parents. So on the legal side, there's work to do, in my opinion, just to level the playing field with other countries like the US. And there are have been recent signs of improvement and movement. Um, we've spoken to legal teams and the judge that handled our case all recognize that there's a need for change there. Um, so I'm confident that the future will be a bit better for the next person. And I don't want to go over time, so I'll hand over. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. And I will just add, uh, as I got distracted earlier, by the camera <laughs> that disappeared at some point when I was introducing Richard, I just wanted to add that I actually met him for the first time uh, in an uh, event for future parents. So that was also part of the activism, right? Those, those, as you mentioned, uh, those events for future parents, um, and probably a half of the uh, public were LGBTQ in deadless parents, and the other uh, half. Um, heterosexual ones. Um, so, so that that how it go, that, that, That's how it goes. And then I read the press releases. That's the kind of information that circulates, right? And that's how we learn about those options. So um, uh, let's um, let's uh, now invite uh, Erica, Erica Tranfield, uh, who's uh, the director and founder of Pride Angel. Um, an organization that helps connect people who want to become parents, donors, co-parents. Hopefully you can say a few words more about Pride Angel, Erica. Um, and Erica is also mom to two baby girls. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Erica. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, I, I first of all have to apologize that if we do get disturbed, we've got um, our eight, eight, nine week old daughter here at the moment. So she's She's happily sleeping at the moment, so we're all good. Um, so yes, I think uh, to describe my journey, so always known that I wanted to be a parent. Um, and then around about, uh, well, it was actually 2009, I was away abroad with my, uh, my ex-wife and we were talking about um, what our options were for, for becoming parents. Um, and when we had a look at the, um, what was available on the internet, um, what was available in terms of the clinic options, um, the internet, there, were, there was a lot of men that were offering sex. And as a lesbian couple, we thought absolutely not a route we, we wish to ever go down um, for, for many reasons. Um, and the fertility clinic route was again, something that we, we weren't too fond on using a donor from um, because we, we didn't have the ability to meet the donor. I should also mention at this point that we are uh, um, scientists in microbiology, so we understand a lot of the infection testing. Um, so at that moment in time, because there was no service um, available to help find um, us a known donor, um, that's why we or when we decided to set up the creation of Pride Angel. So Pride Angel was set up with um, the intent for to help us uh, find a sperm donor, a known sperm donor, but also to um, help fulfill that, that gap um, that was available or that was required to be filled at that time. So the, the, the reason why uh, we felt it was quite important to have a known donor for us um, was because we wanted to, to meet somebody face to face we wanted to be able to know um, who the, the donor was. And we also wanted the ability to, to keep in contact with the donor and for our children to be able to know where they came from. Um, I always say that um, to use a, a donor from a fertility clinic in, in my mind is, is, is great. Um, it provides a different option, um, 
but to look through the books, um, you can have a look for, for donors on basic criteria, such as eye colour and hair colour. Um, but you don't get a lot of information um, about the personality, about the individual that you would so by meeting a person. I always say that on paper, I'm five foot two. I've got bluey green eyes. I've got blondy brown hair. Well, so is Kylie Minogue. And I'm certainly not Kylie Minogue. Um, so for, for, for us, that was quite important to to actually find somebody who was going to be in our life, but that we actually understood who they were um, in order to be able to know whether it was right or wrong. On top of that, I think that it, it's also important, and again, from, from using the known donor perspective, that we wanted for, for the donor to actually choose us also. So I think a lot, of, a lot of men and women, when they're looking for sperm or egg donors out there, always think that it's um, a process that you want the best. Um, but I also believe strongly that the donor should have a choice in choosing the recipient too. So this, is the, the, this was the reason for the creation of, of Pride Angel. Uh, for us, the journey was a, a four year journey. We tried four different sperm donors. Um, and on the, the, the last attempt with the, the sperm donor, um, we did conceive. Um, we used the same sperm donor for both daughters, um, but in between, um, in between having children, um, I actually separated from my wife and um, have a new partner now. We've been together. Um, we actually got together at the early stages of when I conceived with um, Aria. Um, and one of the things that, again, I'm not going to be talking too long because I'm very aware of time, so I'll, I'll keep this quite brief. But one of the uh, one of the big areas that um, we uh, struggled with when going to, um, well, I guess bringing up our children is the fact that um, my first daughter has um, both my wife and I on the birth certificate, um, and that was because we got married. We got married purposefully to, to be able to do that. And I do feel that it pushed us um, into getting married at the time. Um, I don't think that was necessarily a, a wrong thing that we got married as such, but it did actually force us to make it um, um, and make us do it faster than, than maybe we would have done. Um, so to have to, um, to have to go down the process to get married in order to, to go through home insemination is something that um, I think uh, shouldn't have to happen. Whereas a, um, obviously a heterosexual couple can conceive without being married at home and both be on the birth certificate. And then obviously when we uh, went to uh, register ARIA at the birth registry office, we, uh, because we're not married and technically I am um, still in the process of getting divorced, my partner, although we've been together from the very beginning of conception, um, is unable to be on the birth certificate for um, our daughter. So it means that I have one daughter with whom um, we are both on the birth certificate with my ex-wife and for, um, for, our, for uh, um, Aria, we only have one birth, per, well, one parent on the birth certificate, which again is um, a little bit, we feel unjust um, that we've uh, been together from the beginning stages and we actually can't um, both be on that birth certificate. So this is uh, something that um, is very uh, profound for us at the moment and something in which we would like to work um, towards uh, making a difference with, I guess. And I guess that's, that's my story in, um, in a very, very short space of time. Um, but yes. Back over to you. Thank you very much, Erica. And, and I hope we can discuss a few of these issues in, in the second hour as well. And also some experiences that, that you've talked about and that um, you um, know a lot about from your work with Pride Angel as well. Um, and now uh, let me invite Alan, Alan White, who's a trustee of Surrogacy UK. Uh, one of the largest non-profit surrogacy organizations in the, in the UK and an intended parent through traditional surrogacy. I'll leave the rest to you, Alan, please. The floor is yours. Thanks, Martin. And, um, and yeah, uh, 
Surrogacy UK is, um, well, I think you've done the introduction to it really, but um, I'm, a, I'm a trustee of the organ organisation where um, we, we have a particular model for surrogacy, um, which is based on kind of friendship first. Um, and as Richard alluded to, the, the, the systems for surrogacy between the UK and elsewhere um, in the world, in Europe, are, are very different. So happy to talk more about the process around surrogacy if, if that's useful. But um, my personal story, I'm... Um, I was born in a place called Barrow in Furness, um, which is in Cumbria, um, which is, if everyone, I don't know whether anyone's been, but it, it's not the most diverse place in the world. Um, and I was born there in 1980. Um, things perhaps are different these days, but I, um, I, I think partly because of where I came from and who my parents' friends were, i.e. not gay people, um, it took me a long time to, to come out. I came out when I was 22 at university in Manchester. Um, and... I think that's a, I'm, I'm saying that because I think that one of the, the challenges I've had personally is that when I came out, I kind of gave up being a parent um, for a time. Uh, per, being, a, being a family, being a parent had always been kind of part of my story, I guess, or part of my, what I envisaged my future to be. But it was something that I lost when I came out. Um, and perhaps now I know that I didn't need to lose that. Um, but I think in terms of things that I'm passionate about, it's um, encouraging young gay and and these day, uh, and trans people that there are these alternative routes to parenthood that you don't need to give up on that. And um, uh, I was in a relationship for eight years where parenthood wasn't probably ever gonna be an option, but um, I met my now husband um, 11 years ago. Um, he'd had a different kind of experience. He'd never had a coming out moment, but had always known and, um, had never had that thing of giving up on becoming a parent so he was very clear that if we were going to be together we were going to have kids and I kind of said I need some time to think about it because when you've unlearned or you know kind of written kids out of your your future your, out of your story it does take some time I think to to bring them back in um, so I said give me five years um, and five years later we began to think about how we would um, become parents and I think as many gay men do went through all of the options and um, you know uh, decided on surrogacy I'm happy to talk later about why we made that decision I think that that's a well I'll say I'll say now that sorry I found the thought of surrogacy really difficult Initi initially I was very much more in favor of adoption and when I've reflected on that I think it's because I saw a process in adoption, which I understood, and I saw an end point which I, at which there would be a decision. Um, and that's very different in surrogacy. But actually, there is more structure if you know where to go. And if you go to particular organisations and things, there, there is that kind of structured pathway to, to parenthood. Um, we decided on Surrogacy UK from uh, several organisations that we looked at. They, they felt like the best match for us. Um, and... We are now actually, we're quite a long, we're in what we call it a, a team. So we have um, met a surrogate, uh, she's called Emma. Uh, we've been in a trying to conceive where we're traditional surrogacy. So um, I won't go into the gory details of that, but um, we've been trying to conceive for, for two years, which is quite a long journey. I think one of the things that you forget when you're considering surrogacy journeys is there's still biology involved you know there are still miscarriages there's still loss on the journey so we're three miscarriages into a, a two-year um, journey but still very much hoping to become um become parents um i don't think i've ever considered myself as an activist um i got involved as a trustee of surrogacy uk kind of because i wanted to give something back to make sure that this organization um still exists in the future and I think one thing that I'm really passionate about is um, affordability around surrogacy because uh, you know as Richard has, has said and, and well knows um, it's often very very expensive um, and I think that there are particular models you know certainly at Surrogacy UK what we try to do is be as accessible and inclusive as possible um, with low membership fees you know for example um, that's one of the, the things that I'm passionate about. I think just in general, awareness and celebration of alternative routes to parenthood. Um, thinking back to me as a kid, um, would, would my coming out, would my kind of story of my sexuality really have been different if I was more aware of, of things? Um, I, 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 I imagine that's still a very, 
very current issue. And, and particularly, I think, for, for young, young people who are questioning their sexuality, but are um, in families where family is really important, you know, and where that's uh, all that, you know, one of the, the key goals of their future is to become a, a father or a mother. Um, and what impact that recognition of sexuality has on, you know, on, on those people at that time in their life, which is really difficult. And I think, you know, celebrating and making people aware of, um, you know, gay parenthood um, and these roots to it is, is really important. And um, I think there are some issues about, about diversity in surrogacy, which in surrogacy UK, we're quite aware of. Um, I think we're, we, we do have diversity in the community. I think that in the leadership, we are, we are kind of quite white. And I think that there's a, an issue possibly I haven't I don't know the data but there's possibly an issue around um you know the diversity and surrogacy in general and then I think the other three kind of issues that I'm that I'm interested in are all about um attaining an equality between surrogacy journeys and traditional parenthood um, and the inequalities some of some of which Richard has mentioned um there are inequalities in clinic provision for example so I think it's less true than it used to be but um, differential prices for um, surrogacy journeys um, relative to uh, non-surrogacy clinic journeys. Um, there are some inequalities in law and in employment benefits. Um, so Rich has mentioned the parental order is the process through which you achieve parenthood in surrogacy. Um, you are eligible for adoption leave um, as a surrogate uh, parent. Um, like it's a really quite a minor thing until it happens to you that self-employed people are not eligible for adoption leave. There's no there's no support for that. Whereas self-employed people are eligible for statutory maternity pay. And um, you know, so again, it's kind of perhaps is a little bit of a niche issue. But all of these points of inequality, um, you know, I kind of exercise us at Surrogacy UK. They're the things that we want to we want to change. And then I think the big one, and I think it's a really difficult one, is. Um, double gamete donations. So surrogacy in the UK requires that one of the intended parents or the intended parents in the case of solo journeys um, is the biologically related to the prospective child. Now, that's a really big point of inequality because um, whether it's um, because of sexuality, fertility, trans or disability, it's quite often that people approaching surrogacy or who see surrogacy as the best route to parenthood are ineligible for it because of um you know matters beyond their control now in traditional hetero routes to parenthood through ivf double gamete donation is legal and so there's a, a major point of inequality um which i think is a difficult one i don't think it's on the uh, in on the agenda for the forthcoming reform of surrogacy law, which we expect to happen in 2023. Um, but it's something that I think Surrogacy UK would like to um, campaign for. Um, there we go. Uh, that's me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. And, and thanks so much, everyone, for sharing your stories and, and experiences. And uh, we're really grateful for having you here and being able to, to listen to your stories.